the Austin Allegro, a car many people may not recognize. That is unless, of course, you grew up in the UK. For our friends from across the pond, it is a car many people took the driving test in. It is a car that many people have memories of. Maybe not all fond memories, but memories. It is a car that was supposed to be so much more, but endless bureaucracy, questionable quality, and tough competition would put Allegro on a path to infamy. This is the story of Austin Allegro. The Allegro was intended as a replacement for the aging Austin 1100 and 1300 series. The parent company British Leyland would produce its newest offering alongside the Austin Maxi and Morris Marina. The plan was for Allegro to serve as a flagship small car, featuring quality interior detailing more reminiscent of Leyland's more toffee-nosed brands. But it wasn't long before British Leyland probably wished it could turn back time and do almost everything different. Allegro represented a perfect storm of labor and corporate management chaos. The result was a car few people wanted. A car that foretold the future of the British car industry. Automotive workforce labor relations during the 70s in the UK was tense. Workers demanded better wages and fewer hours, while automakers struggled to sell cars due to consistently poor product planning. Obviously, these were not the ideal conditions to introduce a car particularly one as ambitious as Allegro. British Leyland knew they had to produce something innovative to compete with the ever-growing number of foreign competitors. Unfortunately, what BL were producing was not impressing the buying public, and Allegro would turn out to be another offering to continue this unfortunate trend. Part of the problem was a gluttonous acquisition of a dizzying array of brands. From Mini to Jaguar, BL had become so large it seemed it could no longer do any one thing particularly well. And of course, there was Lucas, a company BL would rely on for most of its electrical components. So poor was the quality, Lucas would earn the title Prince of Darkness. Many legends are told of headlights that fell only at night, windshield wipers that only functioned when it wasn't raining and horns that only sounded when you hit the brakes. Some may have been so brave to ask, Lucas, why do we produce such poor quality? It's a good question. Time has shed some light on this dark tale, and it turns out that some of the evil was actually caused by intense and rampant bean counting handed down by the Lords of Leyland. If a quid could be saved by lopping off some seemingly trivial widget the engineers had specified, then so be it. After all, these were indeed dark times. All of these factors led up to a buying public that had had just enough but this was not supposed to be the way things worked out. Like many BL initial concepts, Allegro was to be something new and revolutionary. There were even American influences evident, such as Mustang, particularly in the front end. Sadly, as development evolved, cost-cutting realities would collide head-on with the stylist's original intentions. Baffling design decisions, such as adding several inches in height to the belt line to accommodate the E-Series engine and corporate heater box, would save cost while also eliminating any semblance of low-slung sportiness the designers had intended. The extra bulk naturally also led to reduced economy, a complete deal killer to many during these difficult times. Although many would find the final cost results of Allegro's visual bits ungainly, BL did somehow manage to keep the budget for pricey hidden parts intact. 
A hydrogas suspension system that was more complex than just about anything else on the market was introduced on Allegro. It is a system similar to one the Germans and others would introduce later, and the concept was sound. The system isolated the interior from road shock with the use of nitrogen gas filled bladders. In theory, this was a surprising innovation given all the other cut corners, but many in the press reported a ride that was choppy and even motion sickness inducing. Allegro's attempt to be continental would fall flat. The British public, indeed, were not being served. British Slaylon, of course, would put on their best show to distract from these realities. An advertising campaign was launched that was one of the largest in BL's history. Ads focused on the wide array of Allegro variants. Unfortunately, these variations all looked pretty much the same. A reality illustrated in this early ad. Allegro was introduced to the public in 1973 with a saloon body style and a traditional boot. This configuration was less practical than the hatchback offered by sibling Austin Maxi, and this was intentional, as management felt the feature should be preserved only for Maxi, for reasons unknown. It was early days, but strong clouds already loomed for Allegro. It was clear this was not the car that would save British Leyland. One bright spot was Allegro's interior. Quality of materials was better than expected. This was likely to distract from polarizing exteriors. Seats were deeply padded and there was even some wood tone trim to help warm the ambiance. Gauges were sparse but large and legible. The lower level 1100 and 1300 series models featured the ancient but serviceable A-series engine variants. Higher spec models featured the slightly more powerful and sophisticated E-series engines. And of course, there is the feature all early Allegro models possessed, the infamous square steering wheel. Meanwhile, new competition was introduced from Arch Rebel Ford, which had been steadily gaining market share with its Escort and Cortina offerings. As was the case with much of the competition, Parking an Allegro alongside one of these fresh Ford products only illustrated just how unfortunate things had turned out. Where Allegro appeared bloated and bulky, the competition was low, long, and sleek. Just as Allegro's original designer, Harris Mann, had initially proposed. BL car dealers were desperate to present a product the British public would devour. Sadly, the final product was but a trifle. Although they were little distinguished visually, higher spec models such as the 1500 did provide a bit more luxury and performance, relatively speaking. As was typical at the time, exterior colors were often in a shade of muted earth tones, and vinyl roofs were also on offer. Interiors were reasonably roomy for such a small car. This was accomplished by removing as much structure as possible, which also saved weight. But getting in an accident was not recommended. Sporty options such as fog lights and a more aggressive wheel trim detailing did offer some degree of distinctiveness. Embarrassingly for Allegro, despite all the effort to stand out, the ancient Mini continued to outshine. A two-door saloon was available, but unlike many competitive offerings, it kept the exact profile of the four-door. The result was a car with all of the style of the saloon, or lack thereof, with less practicality. Just the kind of thing people were really not looking for. And the saloon also continued to be saddled with the boot configuration, as converting the body shell to a hatchback was virtually impossible without a major redesign. 
The 1500 Sport Deluxe model featured premium upholstery with deep paw carpeting and individual front reclining seats. The 1500 Special featured a further refined interior with rear center armrests and automatic interior lights. The 1750 Sport was more than just a badge, featuring an overhead cam engine with twin carburetors. A 5-speed gearbox and servo-assisted front disc brake setup furthered this rare model's sporting credentials. And the 1750HL served as the most luxurious Allegro variant this side of Vanden Plaza, featuring twin exterior mirrors, a tachometer, and simulated wood tone center console. A smattering of optional extras was also available for all models, including metallic paint and even head restraints. Series 2 would arrive for 1975 and introduce an estate variant, a shape that somehow managed to be even more controversial than the original Allegro variants. Rumors persist to this day that the body would bend or windows pop out if the car was driven too fast or the jack was placed in the wrong position when changing a tire. The state interiors and powertrains were similar to the saloon, while overall length was still under 13 feet. Load floors were flat, and the rear seats could be folded to accommodate 53 cubic feet of cargo. The 1500 Super Estate featured upgraded interiors and detailing. The finest of all Allegro offerings was, of course, the Vanden Plaza 1500. The Vanden Plaza was practically hand-built in Kingsbury, alongside Daimler limousines and high-end Jaguars. The concept was to provide a greatly downsized car, featuring all of the luxury of larger, more expensive offerings. The interiors were lavish, featuring high-quality leather and genuine wood trim. The Vanden Plaza was designed to be a car even those of the most discerning of taste would recognize as quality. Of course, modesty is always a sign of good breeding, so the 1500 engine in place of the 1700 avoided the appearance of a vulgar display of acceleration. Another Allegro variant was the Italian market Innocenti Regent, and was sold for the 1974 and 75 model years. Now several years on the market, Allegro had at least garnered the reputation as cheap to operate, with some publications labeling it the cheapest of the cheap. Maybe not the ideal praise, but at this point Allegro would take what it could get. Quality would somewhat improve, and BL did eventually manage to figure out how to keep water out of the boot area though every example did vary based on factory conditions at the time the car was built. the close of the 70s, some of the lingering Lucas electrical maladies were slowly being vanquished. As is so often the case, Allegro would improve to something resembling the state in which it should have been introduced in the first place. The square steering wheel long banished, interiors were otherwise virtually unchanged as all of Beale's efforts were focused on the upcoming Metro. Though it is true I am originally from Texas, I've always been fascinated with our friends and their cars from across the pond. Moving out of the parents' house, my first real job had me getting home at around 2 a.m. There was only one fast food joint open and one local channel, the PBS station, broadcasting at that hour. I found great comfort enjoying those Whataburger hamburgers and quirky but oh-so-lovable breakcom characters. They were like family, away from family. And the same fascination applies to British cars of this personally beloved era. A toast to the quirky cars the world over and the wonderful people 
who keep them alive. It was nearly time for Allegro to have been sent off by Mr. Grace when the Series 3 arrived for 1979. Although it could be argued Allegro had actually not done very well, some effort was invested into trying to remain competitive. Changes were minor, with an upgrade to the a Series engine that was destined for the upcoming Metro and revised reel and badge detailing. Sportier models featured quad circular headlamps in place of the rectangular units. Interiors featured plusher cloth and other minor revisions. Allegro had attempted to offer something for everyone, from sporty tape stripes to gilded radiator grills. And having served 10 years, it was time for Allegro to retire and enjoy some much needed tea and light refreshments. And that is the story of the Austin Allegro. I do hope you enjoyed this jolly old genwag. If so, please like and subscribe. I sincerely appreciate it. Faster than a trucker, but